We are live, Doctor Ashish. Excellent. Okay, fantastic. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, everyone, and a very uh, warm welcome to you. Naya Sal Mubarak. Uh, belated Happy New Year to uh, everyone who is back. Uh, Back to school. I, I know uh, we haven't had much of a break, but it is exciting for all of us, uh, not only to have you back in the classroom, uh, but also uh, looking forward to seeing you uh, on campus uh, as soon as possible. I think you will hear more from us uh, uh, in the coming days about exactly how that will unfold. But today we are gathering for uh, uh, something that I think is going to be of wide interest to not only students, uh, and faculty and staff, but also um, you know, people who are interested in um, uh, forging strong relationships uh, that lead to uh, something better and bigger for uh, uh, you know, those that we serve. Uh, at the end of the day, it's, uh, it's the generosity behind the partnership that leads to the multiplier effect. And we're going to hear more about that uh, uh, from a discussion from our uh, uh, distinguished guest, but also from our colleague uh, from the School of Education. So let me just say a few words about the format. We'll deep uh, dive right into the talk and then to the Q&A that will follow. Um, so I will introduce uh, Dr. Alison cook um, and and also uh, uh, our colleague, uh, uh, Tayyaba, Dr. Tayyaba Tamin from the School of Education. Very briefly, we'll hear a talk from Alison for 15 or 20 minutes. Um, and uh, following that, uh, we'll just, uh, you know, um, uh, have a conversation about uh, some of her experiences, some of her thoughts, uh, how she's going to frame this particular topic as it might apply to us. So we uh, look at it indigenously about uh, how we can accelerate the efforts that are already underway at LUMS. Thank you very much again for joining us. It's a pleasure, pleasure to have you on this forum as it is always. And I welcome everyone from within LUMS and also from uh, other communities, other institutions, special welcome to you. So you've probably had a chance to read uh, the distinguished accomplishments of my dear colleague, uh, Dr. Alison cook -Sader. It's such a pleasure to actually see her. It would be even greater if she was with us on campus, but inshallah, at some point we will have that. Uh, for now, what I can tell you uh, beyond the resume, the credentials, I mean, she has, uh, you know, uh, I've had the pleasure of actually seeing her in action in many, many different hats that she wears, and she wears them so effortlessly. Um, uh, her academic credentials are uh, undoubtedly the reason why she's a renowned leader for the whole idea of pedagogical uh, partnerships, pedagogical consultants. Um, and this relationship we are going to uh, unpack. Uh, but beyond that, uh, the academic part, you know, I have seen her inspire others at uh, international conferences, uh, I being one of those who have been inspired. I have seen her on campus uh, in my previous roles uh, in Canada um, and also beyond. We, were, we did a special project together in Grenada uh, where we hit the ground running for something similar that was cooking at an institute there that is happening here at LUMS as well. Um, and I've had a chance to actually do what, uh, uh, what we sign up for uh, in academia, which is to co-write uh, uh, an article together. And she's an editor, as I said, many, many uh, attributes she brings. We're very fortunate to have her. Very warm welcome to you, Alison. Uh, you're okay. going to love your audience because uh, one of the things Pakistanis are known for is a generous welcome, and we offer that to you wholeheartedly. Um, let me also very briefly mention that our colleague, uh, Dr. Tayyiba Tamim, is with us too from the School of Education. She is a professor, and she is also uh, a leader in her own right in uh, establishing and then championing the uh, pedagogical partnership program at the Learning Institute at LUMS. So, you can say she is um, uh, charting new waters with all the enthusiasm that only uh, Tayyiba can. So thank you so much for joining us as well, Tayyiba. We are going to get you engaged in this conversation as well. So uh, having said that, I would like to turn it over to you, Alison, and I'll give you a prompt if you wish uh, in uh, about say uh, 12 or 13 minutes, just so that when you get close to the 15 mark. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for that warm welcome. It's exciting to be here. I wish I were literally there as well, but um, during these times, that's not so possible, but let's hope in the future. And I'm, I'm very excited to speak with you about student faculty pedagogical partnerships. It's been a pleasure to work with your leaders and staff and students alike at LUMS, and I'll be referring to some of their wisdom and words later in my remarks. And I'm gonna focus um, in this short time on the individual and institutional benefits of pedagogical partnership. I'll provide a little bit of context for this work. I'll draw on 14 years of research that I've done in my own context and elsewhere to share some outcomes for individual faculty as well as institutions. And then I wanna honor your own LUMS uh, leaders, um, administrators, faculty, students with reference to some of their words and finally, I'll invite you just to think a little bit about LUM's commitment. And I'm gonna start sharing my screen right now so that you can be thinking for yourselves as I'm talking about what are some of the institutional commitments that you have and how might pedagogical partnership um, contribute to your meeting those. So that's uh, those are up at the top. Of course, that will look familiar to you. <laughs> this is from your own institution. So keep those in mind as I'm talking about pedagogical partnership. So let me turn to forward these. So and let me move this so this is not in your way. Um, so we're at a moment in history that's really incredibly strained right, but also full of possibilities. And it's always been important to my mind to value student perspectives and partnership, but maybe now more than ever. And I wanted to share with you an op-ed that a couple of colleagues and I wrote um, over the summer articulating this. And I'm just gonna read you a couple of, of excerpts from this, just so you have this in your mind. The link, if you want to read the entire thing, is down there at the, the bottom left. But let me just read this. Institutional leaders are making critical decisions about how to teach their students in complex and novel times. Learning from the abrupt shift to remote learning last spring and having spent the summer immersed in professional development on course design for socially distanced face-to-face, -face, fully online and flexible or hybrid teaching and learning. However, even with all of this deliberate preparation, students have been almost entirely absent from our planning and preparation. During this crisis, we need to systematically integrate students into our planning efforts at both the class and the institutional level for our sake and for theirs. So that's really the premise that I bring to this work, have always brought to this work, but I think is especially uh, pressing during these times. So I wanna give you a sense of our program, um, which has existed since uh, 2006. I'll give you a little bit of background on this. So uh, we conceptualized it in 2006 and piloted it in 2007 in response to uh, faculty desire to make their classrooms more culturally responsive. Um, fa faculty realized that uh, their classes weren't as welcoming as they could be to all students. And then based on recommendations from a group of students who didn't necessarily feel like they belonged and were underrepresented, equity seeking groups at our institution, we formed a pilot. Then the way this worked was individual students were paired with individual faculty for semester long one-on-one -on -one partnerships through which they, uh, the students were paid, the undergraduate students are paid by the hour. They are not enrolled in the course and they observe the class weekly. They take um, observation notes on uh, what they see happening in the class and they meet weekly uh, with their faculty partner and they meet weekly with me as the director of the program to sort of talk through how to engage in this quite challenging cross role power laden relationship right so that that is the basic model of this partnership program that we have uh, it can be linked to a faculty pedagogy seminar that I run for all incoming faculty at my colleges. So every new faculty member has the opportunity to, to participate in this in exchange for a reduced teaching load or any faculty member at any time can participate in the one-on-one -on -one partnership with the undergraduate student. And that those people can be in any role whatsoever at the institution. 
So there are variations on this model, year long, uh, either curriculum focused or pedagogy focused. Course design and redesign is another variation. Some departments or offices partner with students uh, to help imagine how to make the wider campus more welcoming and engaging. And also student-led pedagogy workshops and research projects is another component of this. So this is just how our program has evolved and I'd be happy to answer particular questions later on, but just to give you a, a sort of an overall sense. And then I also wanna give you two examples of how partnerships can grow and respond to current situations, right? So, oops. Um, where did that go? Um, over the summer, um, because of the intersection of the pandemic and the Black Lives Matter uprisings in our context, we created a summer component of this program that we had not had before. Usually it runs during the academic year. And through this summer program, uh, I paired 15 student partners with a range of faculty uh, to develop trauma-informed, anti-racist, hybrid and remote teaching and learning approaches. So these 15 student partners worked with 25 different faculty on our campus and 92 faculty on other campuses through a consortium of which we are a part. And they developed this set of resources and that blue button over on the right side of the screen, you can access these resources if you go to this website that's right up at the top of the page here. These are entirely student generated recommendations for trauma-informed anti-racist pedagogical approaches. Um, so this was one way in which we responded to the moment and placed pedagogical partnership at the institutional level such that it could be responsive to students. We also created during the fall a brown bag series. This was again run entirely by students. So they took the uh, resources that they had developed in the summer and created uh, weekly brown bag sessions that faculty and uh, staff from a range of different institutions that are part of this consortium could sign up for and join. So it's another example of student-led uh, conversations. These were students from Amherst, Bryn Mawr, Davidson, Haverford, Vassar, a number of different institutions who participated. So just to give you a, a glimpse, and you're welcome to, of course, the, the website is down at the bottom of the page here. You're welcome to go and, and take a look at that on your own. Um, so I'm going to jump back here to what are the benefits for individual faculty? So one is acclimating more quickly to campus culture and unfamiliar students, right? Faculty who work in partnership learn more quickly what, how they can be on campus. Faculty also build confidence and empathy as and for members of underrepresented groups, right, among students. Faculty develop confidence and clarity about their pedagogical commitments through dialogue with students. They clarify those pedagogical commitments. They also find the courage to follow through on their pedagogical convictions and responsibilities. These are very consistent findings from the research. Um, perhaps obviously, but just to say it out loud, they gain a perspective that they cannot achieve on their own, right? Um, when you're in dialogue with someone with a different perspective, you necessarily gain a wider perspective. They also recognize good pedagogical practices and can make them intentional. They can come to share power with students and responsibility in learning, which does not mean that faculty give up their power. It means that they share responsibility for teaching and learning. And finally, they can generate ways of addressing inequity, uh, partly because students bring those experiences and also just because they become more aware of student experiences. So those are some individual benefits for faculty. Outcomes for students include deepening learning because they think more uh, deeply and intentionally about their own learning. Um, it informs student perspectives in their own acad and academic engagement in their own classes. They build confidence as learners and as dialogue partners. It also nurtures a sense of belonging in students. It gives them a space where their voices matter and they can engage. Uh, they develop a, a sense of empowerment in a productive way, not empowerment like they're going to take over the university, but rather a sense of their own uh, capacity to make their learning what they need it to be. 
It fosters understanding of teachers and teaching, which makes them also more deeply engaged in their learning. And it promotes understanding and appreciation of other students that everybody learns differently and uh, needs to be respected for those differences in ways of learning. Finally, um, it contributes not only to students' sense of their evolution as active agents in their own and others' development, but also in building job skills, you know, that they can take from this work out into the wider world and, and apply you know, in a range of ways. So I'm gonna jump down from these. Wait a minute, okay, here we go. Um, this is uh, just to acknowledge uh, a doctor um, Arshad mentioned that we had written together and I wanted to quote from this piece that we wrote just because it's, it shows that it's a risk to take this kind of leadership, right? To do this kind of partnership work is countercultural in virtually any context. And so this is just a, a quote from our uh, essay that we wrote together on taking roads less traveled. Right? And we said our stories of choosing partnership as a defining mode of educational development reveal deliberate choices and serendipitous steps toward engagement in risky and responsible action that does not guarantee success, but does wear the way for future travelers. Right? So we as leaders, institutional leaders took these risks in order to open space for other people to engage in these ways. I also want to acknowledge um, Lana, who, who was uh, uh, Dr. Lana, and I worked together with a student, Micaiah Foster, to write a piece together about the importance of growth mindset. Right? This is an idea of Carol Dweck's, um, who talks about the importance of not thinking that intelligence or capacity is fixed, but rather can grow. And in our research of a number of different institutions that have started pedagogical partnership, we found that our survey respondents illustrated to the importance of recognizing students as teachers as well as learners, of faculty embracing a commitment not only to learn to be a better teacher, but also to develop teaching styles to grow with the students and culture on campus, and of the openness, receptivity, and dedication of all involved to engaging in learning. So that these are two administrative leaders at LUMS, right, who have been part of this growing movement um, toward pedagogical partnership. I also want to acknowledge your student leaders. You have student leaders on campus who not only helped to launch the LUMS pedagogical partnership program, but also have written about it in essays that are going to be published in uh, my journal that I edit uh, in the spring. And I want to just uh, evoke these voices as well. So one student wrote, it was hard for me to believe that in a culture where there is a high power distance between faculty and students, I was being considered a colleague. I struggled with that unfamiliar concept until I realized the value of trust, which translated my role of student partner into co-lead for pedagogical partnership programs at LUMS. I think that for a culture like Pakistan, where I grew up having bare minimum agency as a student and the inherent sense of hierarchy in the teacher-student interaction, Programs like pedagogical partnerships can be groundbreaking. I presume that why me is the question that many students like me ask themselves when their professors entrust them for a leadership task. My professor chose me as a student partner and then as a co-lead because she trusted me as well as my capability of working in a partnership. After this experience, I think trusting the students is a fundamental value that can work as a building block in faculty student partnerships at LUMS. Very powerful insights right, from this student leader, which apply across contexts, I can tell you. Yes, true at LUMS, but also true everywhere. So uh, wisdom here to learn from, from Fatima. And then um, let me just jump um, to this last slide, which is to ask you to consider as we sort of move into the question and answer uh, segment, how can pedagogical partnerships between students and faculty and staff position LUMS to pursue its stated goals, right? And I put those here again, they were on the first slide, now here they are on the last slide, to advocate, to imagine, to reform, to lead, to innovate. And just think about that, keep in mind this image, this is a student partner who uh, was early on in our partnership program at Bryn Mawr and Haverford. And she's writing up here, I'm not sure if you can see it, learning is not always about comfort. And that's a very important thing to remember when we're thinking about pedagogical partnership and all learning, really. 
right? That, that learning is not always about comfort and that that's sometimes the most important thing is to sit with the discomfort to be able to move into new ways of being. So I'll just ask people to think about this question for a minute or so. And then I know uh, Dr. Arshad is going to lead us in some question and answer. Thank you very much. Excellent. Uh, th thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Alison. You, you've touched on uh, uh, so many of the aspects uh, that very clearly resonate, I think, uh, uh, across borders, across boundaries, uh, geographies, cultures, uh, institutions, and, and so on. It's almost like a universal uh, uh, declaration, if I may, about the importance and need for these. And I was particularly taken by the three Ps that you mentioned for faculty, which I think apply to students as well, which was about uh, perspective, uh, about uh, practice uh, and about power. Mm -hmm. and, and all of those three, I, I think make a lot of sense that uh, we take things for granted until we uh, go through the experience of a partnership. Um, and uh, uh, you know, uh, we have to define what the parameters are. Mm -hmm. um, so one of my questions of course is, you know, this definition thing, like a, a lot of people imagine a pedagogical partnership uh, in conventional ways where, where uh, I've often heard my colleagues say, there's nothing new. I mean, we've been doing this for a long time. We have research assistants, we have internships, we have this and we have that. Um, and students are, are in all kinds of important roles. Uh, what's new about this? Um, mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I think one of the questions I'd like to start off with, both uh, with yourself and with Tayyiba is, you know, what is Lum's definition of, uh, uh, your definition and Lum's definition of what do we mean uh, just for the layperson uh, by a pedagogical partnership? Mm -hmm. Well, I can start with my working definition and then you know, I'll turn over the floor to you who have lived it you know, in your context, but the difference between the kinds of roles that you just mentioned, right? TA and research assistant is that those still tend to be hierarchical. They still tend to be that the students are learning from the faculty member or the faculty member is a mentor to the students and that's a one way kind of of frame. Now, of course, there is learning that goes back and forth in that relationship, but it's not defined that way. And what is different about pedagogical partnership is the definition is that the learning and teaching go in both directions, right, all the time. And that is different. Um, it's not that each person teaches the other the same things, they teach each other different things, but they're both always teaching and learning. And that's an important aspect of this definition. We use the word equal, but we don't mean same. Right. Equal means that people are valued equally, they contribute and are engaged equally, but they are not bringing the same things. They're bringing very different things and that is what is key. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow, that helps a lot because I, I guess it's reciprocity uh, that we are emphasizing here. Exactly. Yeah. Tayyiba, what, 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 uh, yeah. how, how do you see it? So uh, uh, my defin our definition at LUMS is not very different from Ellison. This was a definition that we actually came together as a group. We had this advisory body in which we had invited people from different uh, schools at LUMS and we came up with this understanding that pedagogical partnerships in LAMS actually means working collaboratively with equal respect for the views of the student in which this also involves a bit of vulnerability. So when you enter this as a teacher, you need to sort of like come with this sense that you might be, you know, you might have to share this power. This means that teacher also enters this partnership as a learner with an understanding that there are certain things that we don't know. That is, we don't know how students learn and what is it that they would be more interested in. And this is the knowledge that the students bring to us. So this collaborative uh, thing, and we are focused on pedagogy. We are focused on uh, improve, enhancing teaching and learning quality. So when people say, how is it different from other student, student partners that we have and work with? Well, it is different at LAMS because we are focused on enhancing the quality of teaching and learning. So we are 
specifically focusing on that aspect and making it more inclusive and sort of like um, enabling student voices in it. Excellent. Um, so I, I have a follow up for you, Tayyiba. Just before I ask you that, I want to prompt our audience that um, you know, I love asking questions and you may have heard that in previous sessions that I've attended that I think are far more important than uh, perhaps even the answers. But uh, I want our audience to formulate their questions and, and not be afraid of uh, whatever direction you want to go in. Uh, so uh, think about your questions. You can always submit them and we will inshallah have as many of your questions answered as, as possible. So just a prompt for you to think about questions. Um, so, uh, Tayyiba, you know, <clears throat> when you talk about the quality of teaching and learning, which makes a lot of sense, uh, often uh, people who are, let's say, very much engaged in research and very much engaged in discovery uh, and working in labs or, or doing experimentation or what have you, might feel left behind and say, well, you know, that's research, that's not teaching, so maybe partnerships are more conventional for me and not the kind uh, that uh, the way we are emphasizing these uh, recip uh, reciprocal, uh, you know, uh, leveling of uh, uh, the respect that you talked about. And, and then the stuff you bring to the table that Alison was mentioning, that may be very different, but what are the forms that they can take? So could you tell us more about the types of partnerships, the forms, uh, the breadth and the, uh, and the depth? So we get a sense of that. Yeah, so uh, thank you, Arshad. So for now, we are offering three different types of partnerships. We are offering course design partnerships where the, where the students come together with the faculty either redesign or design an absolutely new course. We, are, we offer um, course, um, course, delivery, uh, course delivery projects in which the students actually, like Alison explained, uh, give some sort of feedback to the faculty member about the kind of teaching that is going on. It's a constant good feed, feedback. And then we also offer um, some research partnership, but this research partnership is focused only on teaching and learning. So it's pedagogical research partnership. And uh, yes. Ashut, if you uh, don't have any more questions, can I ask Alison one question? Because we were yes. having this chat and, I, and she was telling me about how it all started and her concern with being with the students who had very little voice in um, uh, in the educational space. And Alison, could you talk about it and how could we make partnerships more inclusive? Absolutely. No, I was explaining that the way our partnership program began um, at Bryn Mawr and Haverford Colleges back in 2006 was that uh, our administrators asked me to develop a program for faculty to reflect on their learning. And I said I would develop that program if student perspectives would be part of the conversation from the beginning. And I created the program through uh, having student focus groups and it was specifically students who feel um, underserved by the institution who are underrepresented at the institution so they don't necessarily feel like they belong. Um, the institution was not made for them and they're correct. The institution was not made for them. So there are good reasons why students don't feel like they belong and, and that needs to change, right? And so what I focused on in creating our program was thinking about how can we make our classrooms, the language at that point was more culturally responsive. Now the language we use is uh, more equitable more inclusive and in, in increasingly anti-racist and how do we decolonize right our classrooms and so the language has evolved but the commitment is similar to equity and so the very first student partners in our program were five students of color they were all black students um, from different uh, places around the world but they all brought a perspective. Um, and this was the recommendation of the students themselves that it should be students who are underrepresented and underserved by the institution who are in that dialogue. So our program really started out with a commitment to equity that we have then built over the years through uh, ensuring that students whose voices might not otherwise be heard and certainly might not have an influence on what happens in teaching and learning in the classroom and beyond the classroom, that those voices are central to this partnership work. 
and, and they're affirmed. And one of the things you saw in the findings is that students feel a sense of belonging from this program because they are listened to, they are valued, they are respected, and they build confidence through that to have conversations outside of partnership. Right, so they they learn how to talk with their own professors about how to make the learning better. So there are ways in which that equity focus carries beyond the partnership work into daily life. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, Alison. Uh, there are a couple of questions popping up now. Uh, uh, one that actually mirrors mine, but I'm going to defer that one to a second question that has popped up, and it speaks to the question Tayeba just asked. Um, you know, uh, in our own campus, just to give you a context here, uh, talk about diversity and inclusion and accessibility, which I think are all hand in hand. Um, we uh, have taken pride from, from the get go, uh, almost three decades ago, uh, that uh, it was really important to uh, give uh, uh, this university a footprint of what the country was all about. Um, so that we don't become an institution uh, which is uh, serving the elites, let's say, or uh, those classes that can afford. So, you know, it should be merit based on merit and not on any other advantage someone has. And increasingly, there's a criticism of um, many institutions that they don't do that. Um, so when you look at some of the top institutions, uh, the families that people come from uh, are, are not representing the majority of people who are disadvantaged, let's say. In Pakistan, we have a, a, a very concerted effort to deal with that through a, an outreach program we have. We go out to 130 different towns, villages, and so on. So we have this diversity present on our, we have a little mini Pakistan actually uh, on our residential campus. And so what you speak of is, uh, resonates a lot with the institutional imperative of dealing with inclusion. And so I asked the question uh, that uh, uh, Faisal asks, and he says, uh, uh, Dr. Seder, please say a bit more about being equal, but bringing different things that we teach other, each other in this relationship. Um, and is this a matter of attitude and mindset or does it require different pedagogical and process innovations uh, uh, to implement the partnerships? Yeah, these are excellent questions. And um, just to say a quick response to the last one, yes, <laughs> it requires both. And I'll say more about that. But um, I guess I would want to go back to this idea of merit and challenge all of you to think about that, because one of the ways that we struggle in thinking about this is merit has a tendency still to be keyed to privilege, right? We think about merit in terms of what have people accomplished that uh, reaches a certain level but the reason it reaches a certain level is because people have had access and privilege all along, right? To get to that quote unquote level. So part of what I think we need to be rethinking is what do we value? You know, what do we count as, as important? And there's a huge range of what we should be counting as important. And so that's one thing I would say back, um, complicate that idea of merit. Right. And think about what people are bringing. And so that goes to the point about equal. So what we mean by equal in partnership is that everything that people bring is valued, right? It's valued equally. So let's say somebody brings a particularly sophisticated understanding of a subject. That's one thing we value. Another thing we might value is what it's like to try to engage in a context um, for which you have not been prepared. That's valuable. And so both of those are valuable in different ways. And if you bring them together, you'll have a much better understanding of how to create a context in which learning for everyone can happen. Because once you open your mind to the possibility that the way you experience something is not the way somebody else experiences it, and this is something you know, that we were talking about before, then you realize, oh, there's a wide range of ways that people might be experiencing. And both student and faculty partners have this, this recognition of this diversity. And not only do they recognize the diversity, they recognize it as a resource, not as a problem. Because we have a tendency in higher ed and all education to think things need to be um, efficient 
And that often means that they need to be uh, simultaneous and similar and other things like that, that actually uh, is not reality. Reality is that there's a huge amount of diversity and difference and people learn at different speeds and in different ways and for different purposes. And that what we need to be understanding as equal is that each of those is valid and that we need to make sure that our institutions support each of those. So in answer to the second part of the question, it's absolutely a mindset, absolutely a mindset. It is being open and um, receptive and believing that you yourself can grow and change and that others can grow and change and that, uh, that you should respect that, right? That's a mindset rather than thinking, I know everything, I have the answers, everybody else should listen and be quiet, right? That is not a partnership mindset. So that openness uh, and the respect and reciprocity and shared responsibility, which are the three terms that, that we have used in defining pedagogical partnership, that's a mindset along with the growth mindset. Mm -hmm. And then the second part of that is, yes, a range of pedagogical approaches, and those can be co-created with students. Right. We as faculty do not need to be the ones that generate every idea about how teaching needs to go. We can be in dialogue with students and they have fabulous ideas about a range of ways to make learning demanding and welcoming. Right. Those are not mutually exclusive. And so it's not a matter of sort of watering down or reducing the rigor or any of those things that people worry about. Um, it, you know, diversity and inclusion is not uh, mutually exclusive from high quality and excellence. They are in fact necessary nice. to one another. Well, that's a, quite a comprehensive answer to a, <laughs> a great question as well. And I'm going to re-listen to, to this to, to uh, get the many layers. I think you've spoken to a lot of things. They're ringing a lot of bells in my own mind. I have to think about. Um, but you know, your point is well taken about merit. I just wanted to come back to that for a moment that uh, and, and much of your response later on helps me to better understand that it's not just uh, we're looking for a threshold which everyone has to achieve and then we let the, we open the door. Actually, we're looking for potential <laughs> and we're looking for if it's a developmental mindset, then we're, we're also dealing with a lot of unknown unknowns here. Uh, but there are markers of a potential, the hunger to learn, the motivation and the drive people have. And they exhibit that in different ways, not necessarily in a good test score or in a good uh, uh, application. So you're, you're spot on about that. Uh, and we need to learn in how to prepare people for success rather than take success and then say, we're going to uh, 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 you know, cherish that. So uh, thank you. Thank you for opening those doors. Well, and I also want to go back just one other point about that is to think about success may look a lot more ways than we think it does. Right, Indeed. so also learning from students about a wide variety of successes they've already had that we might not recognize as relevant, but are, and yes. also <laughs> reimagining you know, what success in future could look like. Uh, yes, and that is an affirmation, in fact, for that outreach program I referred to you earlier on, that uh, uh, we are not waiting until the application day to let the, uh, those uh, potential students in. They, in fact, are identified way in advance in their high school years, and then they get a chance to come here and uh, you know, be able to compete with those who had the chance to be prepped for writing an entrance exam and what have you. So uh, yes, uh, th those points are really well taken. Um, I, I do want to go back to the uh, student question that uh, from Aisha, who uh, uh, talked about um, uh, uh, the relationship with faculty in the Pakistani context, which again, I think is a universal kind of a question because you know the, the practical side of this is that, especially in COVID, you know, people are exhausted. <laughs> I mean, mentally yeah. exhausted, physically exhausted. They haven't had a break. Uh, they're isolated. They're, there are all kinds of traumas, real traumas uh, yep. and, and challenges that uh, young people and old have faced, continue to face. Um, and that cannot be shrugged away. This has to be uh, uh, taken into account in any relationship building. Yep. But uh, even before that, um, I, I, I think when a faculty member says, look, I don't have any time <laughs> to invest in, in, I already give so much. People just don't know how invested I am in students or how invested I am in the community work, the service that I do or the research that I'm engaged in. 
How do you attract those folks into this partnership model? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And um, just to touch on the, the trauma and the exhaustion and all of that, I do think you're absolutely right. We cannot gloss over that. And that's what our summer pedagogical partnership program was about, is how do we pay attention to that and learn from it and create our classrooms and learning environments differently so that they recognize that human experience that people are having, which of course is not, not everyone's having the same experience, of course. And the pandemic has exacerbated those differences too but to listen to students about what they are experiencing so we can imagine how to better create teaching and learning right now is another form of expertise that students have. But in terms of, oh wait, say the question you, I just lost track of the question you asked me. Oh, um, um, I, I asked you a bunch now, I'm, I'm losing track I myself. I, I was thinking of the next question, but I should stick to the first one. Uh, which was, I tell you about, do you, rem do you remember where we were at? <laughs> we need oh, you. Yes, you were talking about, you know, uh, in these COVID-19 times when everybody's, so how do you structure partnerships around that? And because people find that they have very little time. So oh, have, yes. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. The time. Thank you very much. I lost track the of the time. time. Yeah. So, the, so the, um, the question of time is a really good one. Mm -hmm. It is um, often faculty in every context under all circumstances say this, I don't have time you know, to yeah. do this extra thing. And here's a way to think about that. It will save you time in the long term if you engage in this kind of dialogue and partnership early on. And faculty have said this over and over. They, they say, oh my gosh, if I hadn't had this conversation with my student partner, I would have done X, Y, and Z, which would not have worked. You know, and now I realize that I, I should do you know, A, B, and C instead, and that's a huge time saver. So that's one thing, is that the kind of pre-processing um, and planning that you can do through partnership will save time later. The other thing is that the time you spend together is energizing, right? So it can be exhausting. We know as faculty to plan in isolation, to do everything in isolation, it's, uh, it's very tiring and uh, enervating. Whereas when you plan with students, it's energizing, right? And so even though you're spending more time, you're getting more energy from it. And so those are two ways to really rethink time and how we often think of it in, in deficit terms but we can think of it as, uh, as generative this time. And isn't it uh, universal that when the same faculty members hear from those students that they had an impact on, that they say is the most fulfilling part of their work. Right. Um, so investing right. in fulfillment is a well, good thing. <laughs> and, and related to that point, um, being in dialogue with student partners like this helps faculty learn how to be in dialogue with all of their students in a different way. Right? And this is not about faculty abnegating responsibility. It's not about faculty giving away all their power, nothing like that. It doesn't challenge faculty expertise. That is not what this is about. It is about that kind of exchange and dialogue that helps people recognize how much work they each is putting in, right? Students every single semester say, wow, I had no idea how hard it is to be a faculty member. I had no idea how hard it is to teach. And now I have so much more respect for all <laughs> faculty. And that makes them not only more respectful, but also engage more deeply, right? In their own <clears throat> learning because they see it as a, as a partnership, right? Not yes. just as a performance or as something, you know, to get marks. Or, or a transaction, yes. Or a uh, transaction. In fact, absolutely. And so you bring up the notion of, uh, 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 you know, um, uh, I, I guess humility in, in the sense of understanding each other's, uh, yes. where we're coming from and what we do, and empathy uh, in, yes. in wearing yeah. and walking in the shoes of the other. So uh, thanks for those reminders. A couple of questions, very exciting ones. I want to follow up on uh, one by uh, Dr. Riaz. Um, and he talks about uh, peer instruction, uh, something that uh, uh, you know, uh, may have a very nice parallel here, uh, uh, especially with uh, students, uh, as well as, uh, um, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the second question as well from Humayu, who's a, uh, I'm, I'm going to assume Humayu is a student, um, yeah, yeah. who is asking, 
Oh, you know whom I am. Okay. So. <laughs> I do too. <laughs> oh, on the pedagogical partnership program. <laughs> yeah, one Excellent. Of the Excellent. Yeah. Members. So Humayu is asking, so the first question, remember, was about peer instruction. The second one is about um, uh, um, uh, 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 some of the challenges that you have faced, Alison, uh, when you're thinking of a cultural shift in this mindset you speak of, uh, where if you're, if you're trying to bend the institutional culture in a very positive way, uh, what are some of the challenges and how did you overcome them? Yeah, this is a great question. And also just to channel some of Humayun's wisdom about this, it, um, it's very important to acknowledge that this is countercultural, you know, in virtually every context, right? More so in some than in others, certainly, but in every context is countercultural to be challenging the power and the authority in this way, not to undermine them. Again, I want to say that it's not about undermining, but it is complicating them, right? And so some of the challenges I have faced. Um, speaking directly to uh, the, this beautiful essay that Humayun also wrote, is um, how do you build the confidence in students that they have the capacity for this work? They do have the capacity for this work, but virtually every student I know has said, who am I to do this? How could I possibly have the expertise, the um, authority, the right you know, to say anything to faculty about their work? That is a huge challenge across contexts. And the way that I deal with that is to remind students that the expertise that they are bringing is not the same expertise that their faculty partners are bringing, right? This is again, the equal without being the same, right? They are bringing expertise in being students for years and years in classrooms. They have expertise in being who they are, the particular intersection of their identities, right? Makes them who they are unlike anybody else, right? So. It's a matter of convincing students that they have legitimate perspectives and should be able to share those as part of a dialogue. And it takes a long time. I can tell you it takes at least um, three weeks minimum and sometimes years to convince students that they have this capacity. And the other way that um, I need to work on that is to provide structure and space and guidance for how to talk to faculty in ways that faculty can hear. It is not helpful for students to go in and say, oh, what you're doing is terrible. You know, do this instead. N faculty are not appreciative, you know, of that kind of approach from anybody. But if students can say, you know, in this one class I'm in, the professor does X and it really helps me because, or, you know, I've been in a class where you know, I really struggled with this approach because, and that because is really important because that student brings that expertise with what it's like or has heard from other students and can explain that to faculty in a way that doesn't challenge what those faculty members are doing, but invites them to think about a different kind of experience. So the other way I deal with the, the challenges of the hierarchy is to develop language and ways of noticing and analyzing and reflecting that can convey what students know without it being a direct challenge to faculty. And these are life skills, right? By the way, this is not the last time that it would be useful to be able to say, gee, I noticed this, can you help me understand it? Or gee, I've had this experience and this is why it benefited me. So those are some of the ways that I support students in developing the confidence and the capacity to be in this kind of dialogue. Mm -hmm. So talking about challenges, here's another question related to that, and that is about uh, the partnership and the assessments. You know, so uh, faculty are in, uh, one of uh, one of the uh, uh, responsibilities they have is to give good feedback and, ass and assess and grade. Um, so how is that managed? Does that vary across cultures? Uh, do you find tensions in when it <clears throat> the partnership model intersects with this kind of a power dynamic, perhaps? which has to do with assessment. Yeah, well, where I've seen it be most effective as an intersection is where faculty are willing to think about assessment as a co-creation as well, right? When they're willing to say, these are my criteria, you know, for what you need to be achieving, what are yours and how do we bring those together and how can you best demonstrate your uh, achievements in this course? Mm -hmm. So 
when partnership <clears throat> intersects with the co-creation of assessment, I think there's, there's great congruence there. Um, mm -hmm. That's one of the trickiest areas, right? Most faculty are pretty hesitant to let go of the control of assessment. But when mm -hmm. they do, and this has happened quite a bit in England, there have been quite a number of colleagues who have worked on co-creation through assessment, also in Australia. It, it really, um, it makes a huge difference and it doesn't, it's not attention. And again, it's not about faculty abnegating responsibility. It's more of a shared mm. partnership. When your mm. goal is student learning, why not, <laughs> right? Mm. I mean, mm. if your goal is weeding out, if your goal is uh, ranking, then it won't work so well, right? But yeah. if your goal is really student learning and student empowerment, then there's no reason why partnership mm. can't work around assessment as well. So is it important right from the outset to kind of determine what kind of outcomes the partnership may result in? So there's transparency there and not a lot of guessing around about what, uh, you know, and I don't mean uh, we're signing any contracts here. I, I mean, when you say people bring different things to the table, so you're a co-writer or, or you're a co-presenter or you're a co-designer, whatever the partnership may entail, uh, should the expectations be very clear or is this more like a, um, uh, uh, you know, a sort of a, not mentorship because you're mentoring each other. I mean, more of a um, expert novice kind of a, a, a model where learning also takes place. Um, so how would you sort of yeah. talk about- those I issues? would say it's important to start with some goals with the recognition that they will evolve. Mm -hmm. So it's a kind of a both and. I think if you don't have any idea at the beginning and don't have any kind of parameters and just sort of say, gee, let's see what happens, that, that will not be the most productive partnership. Mm -hmm. But if you start with some preliminary goals, like if a faculty member says, I really wanna focus on uh, facilitating discussion among students rather than having everything go through me, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's common among faculty to, to want that kind of more dynamic conversation. So let's say you start there, then there's a focus, but then it will evolve right? Or I want to do this research into X, but then as you're doing the research, you find all these other things and then it evolves. So I think key is starting with some idea about what you want to be doing and having the openness to let it evolve. And the third piece is to regularly be in dialogue about that, to check in. Are we meeting the goal that we had? Do we need to revise it? Is, is what each of us is doing contributing to that or do we need to revise that? So that kind of communication is essential. If people aren't talking together, then they're gonna have different ideas about what they're doing. So uh, here's a tough question. Uh, and, and you know, I've been in it myself. So I, I, I think I'd love to see, hear your take on this. And Tayyiba, jump in if you're feeling some of this is happening in your own uh, uh, situations, which is that, uh, uh, you, you know, uh, some people say that the model requires a third party, uh, a sort of a broker when things don't work, when that power dynamic in theory, uh, people agree to. But when it comes to behaviors, you tend to sort of repeat the mindset that you're used to and yeah. treat the other person without even perhaps consciously being aware of this uh, right. in, a, in a disparaging way or uh, in shutting them down. And, you know, it could work uh, 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 typically in situations where there is that uh, uh, stakes uh, are fairly high. Um, so do you, so one practical question is, do partnerships require mediation or let's say a third party uh, or should they, is that common? And the second part I think is one that is often raised in many conferences I've uh, heard you speak at and been uh, in myself is about the um, uh, valuing of the work by also uh, a paid partnership. So should should students be paid for the work? So so practical questions. Uh, yeah. what, what what do you think? Yes, um, I do think that there needs to be structure and facilitation of partnership. Yes, I do. And I and when I consult everywhere and I've consulted on six continents about this, I say every single time. The most important thing is that there is structure and support for the student partners, because we are asking both student and faculty partners to engage in, again, a countercultural, complicated power dynamic, and the students need support. Ideally, the faculty need support too. And many institutions uh, have a structure whereby, like ours, um, I meet with my student partners every week. 
throughout the semester, every semester. And sometimes that's five meetings a week because of the number of student partners that we have. It's a lot, right? But I think it's absolutely essential. Um, other programs do that and also have monthly faculty meetings, for instance, of the participating faculty. So yes, I do think, I'm not sure I'd use the word mediating so much as creating structure and space and guidance for how to engage with one another. There sure. have been times when I've had to mediate, when there's been a disagreement and we've had to go back to first principles and say, you know, what is this about? Let's think about the assumptions you might be bringing and, and reimagine those. So yes, I, but not very often, partly right. because of the structured space that students have to sort of work through and develop the capacity to do a lot of that management themselves. Frankly. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So, and then to your second question, absolutely students should be compensated for this work, whether it's through pay, our students are paid typically, through course credit, which is another option that some institutions have, or through uh, some kind of uh, fellowship, right? Because people have very different ideas about how to compensate students because of how it then positions them, right? As soon as you put, make it a course, it becomes the academic arena. Right? As soon as you pay them, they actually become staff, right? Not only students. And so it's very, it's complicated, but I think it's worth, and this is something I talk about in, in my book about this that I co-wrote with two students, um, by the way, and I'll, I'll show an image of that at the end. Um, it is absolutely essential that they are compensated in some way. And on top of that, I would say, even after the compensation, um, it hardly covers what this work requires because one of the biggest demands is the emotional labor of this work, right? There's the time, certainly, but the emotional labor of having to engage in these ways and be thoughtful and careful and deliberate and intentional is incredibly intense, especially for students who are already managing a lot of invisible emotional labor in trying to navigate these, you know, many hostile institutions, right, to yeah. who they are, it's very demanding. And so I would say it's, uh, Actual compensation is important, but so is recognition that you can never compensate enough for the incredible labor that students put into this work. Right. Um, so we're, we're sort of hitting the, um, uh, at least here, the uh, uh, last five minutes or so. And before we wrap it up, uh, there, there are a couple of questions that, that remain in the box that I see before me. Um, so I'm going to very quickly uh, ask you two of them. And Tayyiba, uh, I, I've been just uh, feeding the questions from, from the audience, but don't, don't hesitate to add yours as well. So we'll give Alison a, three questions that she can answer one of them or all three, and it'll be all up to her. So w one question uh, that uh, uh, Aima asks about co-creation is, uh, what is the flow of feedback? Who monitors the feedback? Uh, so it's a question uh, about flow and feedback. Um, my, my own um, question that I've sort of uh, gathered from our uh, conversation today, which I think is a, it comes back to how we started about uh, the institutional imperative is about scaling partnerships. Um, and, and that too, I guess, is a sort of a grand challenge because I would think in, in the best of worlds, you know, partnerships are ubiquitous. We don't even have to have these conversations. They happen as part of the university experience. You have a partnership. It's not ex to go there will take time and it does have a, you know, it could be a bumpy road. So any suggestions you have about scale would be really appreciated. And, and Tayyiba, the last word is to you. You, you can uh, yeah, two ask Two questions your for Alison. <clears throat> a, uh, uh, regarding the mediation, uh, I would like your advice on it because we do do a lot of mediation, like Dr. Lona got her, Fatma are on there. But we felt that once a really, well, the partnership is sort of like um, at times is beyond repair. So we were thinking actually of drawing out some sort of contracts, not sort of like uh, to guide people along the way. So how do they talk to each other? How could they resolve a conflict? So please a comment on that. Uh, and the other thing is, do you think it is a good idea that this uh, concept of uh, pedagogical partnerships should also travel beyond LUMS. I mean, we should be as you know, different universities at national level should be talking about it, which should become a part of HEC, how they assess quality and also internationally. So uh, 
to your comment on that. Sure. Um, so in terms of feedback, uh, I think it's important that there be um, interim feedback and final feedback on this work. That's what we do in our program. And really, I would advocate multiple moments of informal and formal feedback. I uh, facilitate that in our program. And um, the, the questions that I use are in the book that I'll uh, put up on the screen in a minute. So um, there should be that kind of feedback. I want to qualify that by saying it should not be linked to anybody's review for reappointment or promotion. That is very important to keep this partnership work separate from formal evaluation of faculty and of students. I think that is key. And I can, you know, we can talk about that more at another moment, but I just want to say that out loud. Um, in terms of scaling, I think um, I would want to say that I think the partnership model is amazing. I don't think it's for everyone. And so I don't think it should become an orthodoxy. I don't think it should become everybody has to be in partnership and uh, no choices. Um, just won't work for some people and it would do more damage than good. So I think it's, it's worth thinking about how can you, um, to go back to something you said earlier, Ashad, how can you find where partnership is already happening in some ways and maybe reframe it to be more explicitly about partnership? That would be one way of scaling because you'd recognize where it's already happening and just needs to be kind of re renamed, you know, in a way. Uh, another would be how do you um, sort of create um, mm, not a hierarchy so much as a distributed, you know, model. Of, of what this might look like. And that would be, a, a, again, a longer conversation, but I wouldn't wanna just see something become, okay, everybody has to do it immediately, let's move to that. I think that would be detrimental. So I would wanna think through how do, you, how do you change mindsets? How do you leave space for people who can't live in that world and don't want to? And um, so those are two things about that. In terms of the contract, I think it is, um, if you're finding you know, that people aren't, can't be on the same page in a consistent way, I do think it's a good idea to have some uh, guide, what we have is guidelines. And um, you can, you know, I think you do use some of those, but you may want to elaborate on them, expand on them, um, to have agreements about what might happen when there are disagreements, right? What do you do? and what language do you use? So I do think it makes sense to do that, um, even if just as a backup, you know, if it may not come to that, but it's good to have those there. So I'd be happy to talk through those with you. And in terms of expanding beyond LUMS, I think it'd be amazing. It'd be fantastic to create a network, you know, of institutions in Pakistan where you really are thinking about this kind of partnership work. This is happening in our context through uh, actually a student-led, intercollegiate um, partnership program where student partners across institutions are supporting one another, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. And we're also doing it through our own um, sort of institutional level consortiums. So we're part of a 10 college consortium and that, that brown bag series that we had was actually a, cr a great example of how faculty and staff from 10 different institutions came together to have weekly conversations with student partners. So I think it's, it's a great, great, great model. I, I'm gonna share with you, um, I know we're right at time, but just so you can, people can have these um, resources. Here I am trying to talk and do it at the same time, which I'm not very good at, but here is a, a final slide um, that shows some of the books um, that I have worked on and I have another book coming out soon with some colleagues specifically on the potential of uh, pedagogical partnership to promote equity and justice. That's coming out soon, but these three texts will give you a lot of advice. The, uh, the greenish bluish one, Engaging Students as Partners, it was the first book that I co-authored with Kathy Boville and Peter Felton. Um, that has sort of a lot of guiding principles. The middle one, Pedagogical Partnerships, has a lot of how-to, very detailed how-to within the main text and with resources. And then the one on the right includes um, a number of stories about how faculty and students build confidence and courage and capacity through partnership. And all of these speak to this bell hooks idea that learning and talking together, we break the notion that our experience of gaining knowledge is private, individualistic, and competitive.
By choosing and fostering dialogue, we engage mutually in a learning partnership. Right, so they all, all illustrate that. I'll, I'll pop back out again, but you also have these slides so that if, uh, if you want to share them, you can. Fabulous, fabulous, Alison. This is a wonderful way to uh, uh, keep the conversation going for uh, uh, both sides. Uh, I'll leave uh, both of you with a, a question. You can consider it either personal or professional. Uh, I'm, so I'm going to frame it uh, uh, as, uh, you know, we, we've been talking about our experiences, but let's also think a little bit about uh, what's to come. So Tayyaba, the question for you is the same for, uh, as it is for Alison. What are your future plans? Whether that has to do with pedagogical partnerships or not is entirely up to you. You can, you can uh, 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 frame it either way. And, and then uh, after your responses, I just want to thank you again and uh, close off with one uh, last sentence. So um, maybe Tayyiba, you'd like go to ahead, start. Yeah. Tayyiba, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely would like to um, scale up in, you know, uh, the pedagogical partnership program. We would like to or layers to whatever we are right now. Totally like Tom, back. Uh, you talked about Ellison. Um, we would also like to work on some sort of grant or fellowship program where we can encourage pedagogical research. We'll talk to you more about into Arshad also. And I'm really, really committed to this idea. I really like this idea and we like this idea as a team also to take it to other institutions, to form networks and partnerships across um, sort of like internationally and nationally, very important nationally. So totally committed to this uh, and our team is totally committed to this also. Thank you so much. Yeah, and I would say the same. I'm totally committed to this partnership work. Um, we are focusing more and more on how it can help us become um, anti-racist institutions, which it's again past time, you know, for us to be. And so that's a big focus of my work currently. And I, I will continue and I hope we will collaborate, you know, internationally on, you know, continuing to create these networks and bring this option of partnership, you know, to all different kinds of contexts. I've seen it take off in, you know, incredibly in the last 10 years from just, uh, you know, when we started it, um, now there are partnership programs like this at you know, 70 institutions. I mean, there's a huge, huge growth and they all need to be particular to the institutions, right? There's not a one size fits all and that's part of what those books talk about. Um, so it needs to be a dynamic and, uh, and growing um, notion of partnership. And so I'm also committed to learning uh, from other cultures and individuals what it needs to look like in different contexts. I learned a great deal when I was in Aotearoa, New Zealand about what partnership might mean there and how that's different, you know, from my understandings. And so I, I know I have lots more learning to do from other people about what this can look like in their context. Fabulous, Alison. This is a great segue for me to also acknowledge a couple of other people. Uh, they've come up in the conversation, but I want to formally acknowledge them. <laughs> One of them, of course, is the director of the Learning Institute, uh, Suleiman Shahid. And Suleiman uh, will tell you, he, he enacts it uh, in the work that he does himself with, uh, I don't know how he spins uh, all of the uh, engaged students that he has at so many different levels. But he has embraced this as a core, uh, you know, uh, foundational uh, way forward for the Learning Institute. So I want to thank him. I uh, also want to thank Lana, and she has been instrumental. I mean, you mentioned her several times, and she really does deserve a, a lot of kudos, not only for enacting this, but for working so closely with Tayyaba, who uh, herself uh, is uh, emerging as our leader, who, who will take us forward in, in this adventure. So, Alison, uh, thank you so much. The applause comes from all of us to you. Um, and you can't believe how thrilled I am, how delighted I am to actually uh, uh, see that I'm just pretending you're, you're sitting right here. <laughs> uh, we all have plants behind us, so there's something common in our background. <laughs> but the next time uh, uh, we will, um, you know, uh, probably find ourselves in another setting and uh, really look forward to uh, uh, staying connected with you. Thank you so much for everything you've done. For the time you've given us, for the encouragement and support, it's invaluable. 
Well, well thank you so much. You. I mean, you all are an inspiration as well. And I look forward to seeing what you do and being part of it and moving forward. So thank you so much. Thank you, Advancement Team. Thank you, Mohammed. Thank you all. Thank you, audience. Thank you so much for your questions. Thank you for being with us today. I uh, hope you want to uh, uh, engage others who uh, take advantage of uh, our conversation. Forward this link to uh, other folks uh, so that uh, they can benefit and learn too. Shukriya, bahut shukriya aapka. Khuda Take care, everybody. See you soon.